In this series of videos, we've been looking at the very worst World War II fighters, but don't let that deceive you because nothing's set in stone. We've already seen some aircraft which were pretty decent and had the potential to be the very best World War II fighters. In the last video, I discussed three questionable aircraft, so if you haven't seen that one yet, go and watch it after this one, where I've got two more candidates for your consideration. So which of these two fighters should make the cut and join the ranks of the Russian Lag 3 and the French Cordon C714? Been working on my accent there. One aircraft that is on every list of the worst World War II aircraft is the Brewster F2A, dubbed the Buffalo by the British, who had a habit of naming other people's planes. When I pitch the Buffalo, it's always surrounded by a sweating ground crew on a Pacific island somewhere, being operated by predominantly land-based units. But in actual fact, the Buffalo started out as a carrier-based fighter essentially designed for the Navy to replace the FF-1, which doesn't have an official name since the British weren't allowed near it. Brewster, which had only entered the aircraft design and production industry in 1932, beat out the competition, including an embryonic version of the F-4F Wildcat, and the Navy ordered some 150 models of the Buffalo between 1938 and 1941. However, despite initial praise, the fighter didn't really live up to its potential and was actually hampered by the very Navy specifications it met. Wingspan and weight requirements meant that it had undesirable flight characteristics and limited choice in power plants, all of which led it to being inferior to a new generation of European fighters also being produced at the same time. Not only was the airframe limited by Navy requirements, its production was also hampered by the inadequate setup Brewster had in its New York factory. Located in Queens, the several-storey production line resulted in the aircraft being assembled at least twice. Once for inspection in the factory and again for flight testing after it had been disassembled for transportation. This time-consuming setup was further hampered when foreign orders flooded in during the run-up to the war. Saying all that, the Brewster Buffalo was quite advanced for its time and even underwent wind tunnel tests which enabled accumulated drag to be reduced in its design. This was quite a revolutionary process which would be exploited by other aircraft designers from there on out. However, as better performing fighters came onto the scene, for example the greatly improved F-4F Wildcat by 1941, the Navy realised that the Buffalo was not ideal for carrier operations. This was down to a combination of its lack of performance as well as the frailty of its landing gear, something quite important for carrier operations. So the Navy palmed their buffaloes off on the Marine Corps and foreign nations such as the Finns. Other nations such as Britain, the Netherlands and Belgium also made orders. The former because they deemed the buffalo to be ideally suited for the tropics as a stopgap fighter. The British fully expected the modest performance of the buffalo to be more than adequate to combat any threat from the Japanese. This was likely based on a feeling of racial superiority and a lack of appreciation for what the Mitsubishi Zero and other Japanese fighters could do. When war did break out in the Pacific, the Buffalo was all but decimated by the Japanese, with few exceptions. Dutch operated Buffaloes, defending their Pacific possessions, were literally wiped out, and British and Commonwealth squadrons operating the aircraft struggled against the better performing Japanese fighters. But was this really the fault of the Buffalo? Although it was more than certainly outclassed by the Zero and was delivered to the front in a specification that didn't represent its optimum setup, it was actually perhaps the pilots flying it that were the problem. In the hands of inexperienced and undertrained pilots, the Buffalo was cumbersome. When flown by an experienced aviator, the plane could inflict significant damage on the enemy. The best example of this were the Buffaloes that found themselves into the hands of Finnish pilots combating the Soviet Union. In this theater, the Buffalo arguably became the most effective fighter of the entire war. At one time, its kill ratio was as much as 62 to one. And one particular squadron, the 24th, accounted for a reported 459 Soviet aircraft for the loss of just 15 Buffalo. A better climate, improved tactics, and field adaptations to the airframe resulted in a deadly fighter which tore the Red Air Force apart. So, should we still include the Brewster Buffalo on the list of the worst fighters of World War II? I have a special place in my heart for biplanes. My first ever flight in a light aircraft at the ripe old age of 15 was in a de Havilland Tiger Moth, the same type my grandfather had learned to fly on during the Second World War. That being said, 
Had I been getting my wings at that time, I would have hoped my days flying a biplane ended with a trainer. Not so for many Italian pilots of World War II. The Fiat CR42 Falco is possibly the best biplane fighter I've ever designed, or at the very least, near the top of the leaderboard. What is astounding is that it was developed after its main rivals and even Fiat had produced a monoplane fighter, in their case, the G50 Freccia. The CR42 could be said to be the result of a struggling Italian armament industry and unfounded faith in the importance of maneuverability. While Germany had seen the potential of its BF109 in the Spanish Civil War, the Italians had been dazzled by their own CR32. Due to its success in the Spanish skies, the Italians decided to develop the design further, ultimately resulting in the CR42. When Italy entered the Second World War in June 1940, the Falco equipped a large proportion of the frontline fighter squadrons. The CR-42 was most heavily used in North Africa against the British, but did see action over Britain itself, as well as against the Soviet Union in the Hungarian Air Force. Initially, the CR-42 was well matched against the RAF and Commonwealth squadrons operating the Gloucester Gladiator, itself a biplane. The maneuverability of the Falco made up for its limited armament. However, when the Allies began sending faster monoplane fighters to the theatre, the CR-42's days were numbered. At first, it seemed that the Falco could engage successfully with Hawker Hurricanes and P-40s that were replacing British gladiators. This was because the Allied pilots were attempting to dogfight with the Italian biplanes. When they changed tactics and exploited their speed advantage through boom and zoom attacks, the Italian pilots couldn't respond. Eventually, the Italians would start to equip their squadrons with more competitive monoplane fighters, but the CR-42 remained in service until the end of the Italians' war. Germany even adopted the fighter to combat partisans, and the last reported victory of a CR-42 was achieved by a German pilot over a P-38. This loss was not confirmed by the Americans. So does the Fiat CR-42 Falco deserve to be on a list of the worst fighters from World War II? Was it a sound design but just outclassed from the get-go? What do you think? So, do the Brewster Buffalo and CR-42 Falco deserve to be on the list of the worst World War II fighters? Let me know in the comments what you think, and if you've made it this far, please like the video to help it spread to others, and if you want to support the channel, you can check out the description and find out lots of ways you can get involved. Thanks for watching guys, and see you in the next video.